For your consideration, the B clause of verse 6 says, These have turned the world upside down. These that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. Our theme has been for this week, pressers influencing the world, taken from this text. But tonight I want to preach to you from this same text. Uh, this subject, before I give you my subject, the phrase upside down comes from a Greek word that literally means to disturb or to disquiet. Things were fine till these people came and caused trouble. We were doing good till they showed up. Everybody was getting along in the city. The synagogue was getting along with the heathen temples. The, 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 the Gentiles of Thessalonica and the Jews of Thessalonica, we were doing just fine. Wasn't nobody saved, but they were getting along. We were happy with things the way they were until these troublemakers came. And that's what I want to preach uh, tonight from the subject, God's Troublemakers. And when I finish preaching tonight, I'm going to pray a troublemaker's anointing on every soul that God anoints us to turn our world where we have influence upside down to discomfort those who are satisfied living in sin to, to challenge people to get right with God. Somebody shout, Lord, Lord, make me a troublemaker. Hallelujah. God's troublemaker. Preach me, Lord, for a few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. A shot that was heard around the world, and if not heard around the world, it was certainly heard in Satan's kingdom. I mean, it was a pie shot when Jesus said, how can one enter into a man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. Jesus said this to explain his power to perform exorcisms. For when the, the Pharisees saw Jesus in Mark in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, cast a devil out of a man, they said that Jesus did this through the power of Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Our Lord's response was an amazing one. He said, well now, if any kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And he said, if Satan's kingdom is divided against itself, then his kingdom cannot stand. Then he went a little further. He said, and if I cast out devils by the power of Beelzebub, then by whom do your pupils, your apprentice, your fellow Jewish brethren, whose power are they operating under when they cast out devils? Now, what through the Pharisees was that Jesus was not the first exorcist. Even the, the Jewish historian Josephus uh, in his antiquities tells of eyewitness accounts that he saw of Jewish exorcists uh, casting out devils and casting out the dispelers. But they use incantations 
they used roots. They used twigs. They used chants to get the devil out. And one exorcist to prove to the people that he had cast the devil out of a man set up a basin about 300 yards or a few hundred yards away from the man. And when he cast the devil out as that demon went out, he commanded that demon to knock that basin over and the demon on the way out did. So there were exorcists casting out devils before Jesus. But the thing that made Jesus' exorcisms so different was that Jesus used no chance. Jesus used no spells. Jesus employed no roots, no incantations. Jesus said, come out. That's all. Come out. And the devils came out. They'd never seen it on uh, this order that a man would have that kind of power. Then he announced, and Satan got the message good, message good, that a man cannot walk into another man's house, take that man's furniture, take that man's goods, take the possessions of that man's house, unless you bind the man of the house first. That was Jesus' way of saying, Satan, you're bound. I have news for you. Judgment has been passed, and you are bound. And it's stronger than Satan has arrived. And I can walk up in his kingdom and cast devils out. Another shot that was fired, uh, that was heard, was when Jesus sent out the 70. Luke recalls it in Luke's gospel chapter 10. Read it when you get home. The 70 came back. They were very, very happy. Saying, Lord, even demons and evil spirits are subject to us through thy name. And our Lord responded and said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from the sky. He wasn't saying that he saw Satan that day, but he was referencing what, what Ezekiel talked about. Way back in the day, Ezekiel uh, chapter 28, verse 16 and 17, it says, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned, and therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Uh, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. He said when, when Lucifer, when the uh, Arab, when the angel, the devil got too high and allowed the blessings that God gave him to make him uh, get beside himself and he called him the uh, cherub that covereth. He says, I am going to bring you down. And that fall Jesus saw. So he said to the disciples, I saw Satan fall from the sky. And he says, the victory that you have, you've experienced today, he says, behold, I give you power to cast out devils and scorpions. And, and he says, nothing shall by any means hurt you. So he says, you got the victory yesterday. And I'm giving you power to have victory tomorrow. But the main thing you should be excited about is that your name is written down in heaven. This passage speaks to a future defeat suffered by Satan as Jesus and his disciples uh, were victorious in ministry. Amen. Thank God for his power.
as awesome as their power were, the most significant thing, as I mentioned, was that they made sure that they were good and saved. Now let's fast forward this some 61 years into the future. We see Paul the presser. I mean, Paul the apostle. <laughs> the apostle Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. They made their way through the mountains of Macedonia along the Ignatian Way, through the cities of Amphipolis and Apollonia to the capital city of Macedonia, they got to Thessalonica. This was an arduous road. Hear me just for a few more minutes. A winding road through rugged mountain passes. They traveled from Philippi, according to chapter 16, verse 12, to Amphipolis. That was a 30-mile walk. And from Amphipolis to Apollonia was another 30 miles. And from Apollonia to Thessalonica was 40 miles. They walked that long road. Danger all around. But they got there. They arrived in, um, praise the Lord, Thessalonica. For Paul the presser, and for Paulos, and Apollonia were little overnight stops. In his mind, he had to get to Thessalonica. Praise the Lord. He had to go, listen to this, where the people were. He went to the universities. He went to the great centers where the populations, uh, where people were concentrated. He went to the seat of power and influence. Amen. Some of us, we love serving the Lord, but we don't want to serve God around people. We almost, we get around the crowd and we get ashamed of the Lord. Paul said, no, I want to go where the people are. I want to go where the power brokers are. I want to go where the crowds are because I believe in the God that I serve. I'm glad tonight that I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I'm glad tonight that I look forward to sharing Jesus to the masses to as many people as I possibly can because there are no people that I can be around that make me ashamed of my relationship with my Savior. Amen. Thessalonica was a major trade route, a major shipping center. In fact, it was the major tra trade route, trade post of that day. And the Thessalonians were tough-minded rugged Southern Europeans. They were sharp business people. They were powerful, tough, and, uh, and they lived at the seat of power. Thessalonica had its own constitution, and they were some, uh, did I say they were rough? They were some rough people. Paul wanted to go where the rough people were. Some of us uh, don't want to witness to the rough people. Some of us are too saved for the clinics. Some of us have too many things going on to stand out in the sun and cry for the life of an unborn child. Some of us are too sophisticated to preach a tent meeting or to go to a reservation in North Dakota. Go way up there where there are no fancy amenities and preach to Indians who can't raise you thirty or forty thousand dollars. Some of us are too advanced in God. Praise the Lord. Not long ago, I went to a uh, a outing uh, somewhere. I don't know where I was uh, in uh, uh, St. Louis, and we end up going somewhere in Illinois. Uh, uh, Rocky, you remember? And um, and and Ron Peoples was with us, and we went way down. Way down, way down. I'd never been that far in the woods before. And we went way down, and uh, we stayed at, it looked like a compound. And there were no, oh, oh the mosquitoes were amazing. And there were no, nothing fancy. The, the, little, the little bed was about that wide. Praise God. And, uh, and, and it was hard. And, and the floor, it looked like a miniature cabin. 
where we were. And, uh, and when you open the door where you, we were staying, you open the door to the street. And when you close the windows, the curtains wouldn't come together all the way. So, praise the Lord, you had very little privacy. And, uh, of course, Lester, you better be glad you, you didn't go because you couldn't have been able to even get in the bathroom, much less to take a shower. No room. But we went there to have church. And when we got that, when we got to the service, my God, Lord, the, the Lord moved in a mighty way. The next night, we were on the plane out of town flying to the nation's capital. And uh, they had us uh, at some great big Marriott with all of the amenities. And I was glad to see it. <laughs> you don't need me lying about it. I was glad to see it. But thank God that uh, the nice things hadn't spoiled us to where we can't go where we need to go and do battle for Jesus Christ. Don't let this stuff fool you now. All of this, you see, these, these things, they are symbols. Now, they are symbols. They are symbols. Praise the Lord. But if you don't do the work when you put the stuff on, you're lying. No, it's a lie. See, if you don't, the, the collar, all of these things you wear, they, they, uh, praise the Lord, they, they say that we, when we walk away from here, we do real church work. We witness, we reach souls. Now, if you put on all of the gregalia, gregalia and you don't do the work, then it's a lie. Praise the Lord. We're all, we dressed up. We got on our dark colors, but you got to take that off. And, and you got to go to Thessalonica. And you got you to be willing to witness to people on the street and talk to people about Jesus. Too many of us do not share the faith. Too many of us are silent. And we're silent. Oh, here I go again. We're silent on issues that matter. And we're vocal on issues that don't hardly mean much at all. Lift me up on my monitors a little bit here. And, uh, and so when it comes down to, to, to righteousness and, and morals and morality and, 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 and life and, and fighting for the unborn and straightening out the LBGTQ community and standing our ground, some of us don't talk about that stuff unless we give 10,000 disclaimers before we say what God gives us to say. But I'm telling you, you keep yourself where you can take off your church clothes and, and, and put on some everyday clothes and do the work of God. And then sometimes you don't get the luxury to take the church clothes off. You got to get down and dirty and cast out devils with your fancy shoes on and fancy suits on and praise the Lord. Go on and cast them out. That's what I'm talking about. See, you can't let this stuff, you can't let this stuff spoil you. Praise the Lord. Some of us can't serve if it's a little warm. We, we're about to faint, so we know you're not going to stand out in the sun. Some of us can't serve if it's too cool. Well, we know we can't count on you for street ministry in the wintertime. You've got to let God give you a tough exterior because the world is tough. The world is tough. The world enjoys toughness. Notice how the world is now in your face. Always protesting. Always screaming about something. Always trying to shut down this and shut down that. And intimidate you and silence you. I won't be intimidated. I will not be silenced. I'm God's man. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Somebody shout something for Jesus. Four men walk into Thessalonica. God Almighty, four men made their way. They dared to go into this city with these tough southern Europeans. They dared to walk in, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. As a result of what happened in uh, Philippi, they were fired up. For a hundred miles ago, in Philippi, they went down by the river. 
and found some women down there praying. And they joined in with the women. And they had a prayer meeting. And a little damsel, a little girl with the spirit of divination joined the Christian band. But she hadn't got delivered yet. Followed Paul and Silas for a few days saying these men are great men of God who have come to show us the way of salvation. But Paul heard that spirit in her for she had a spirit of python. She had a spirit that gives us the word ventriloquist. Voices were coming out of her. High voices, low voices, multiple voices, all at the same time, saying that these men are great men of God. Paul discerned that she was full of the devil. And you know what Paul did? Paul robbed her of her ability to earn a living. Paul, praise the Lord, cost her her job. Because you know now folk, folk would justify their sin by saying, well, that's my job. That's the way I earn my living. Praise the Lord. I, I sing here and sing there. I join up with this group. I join up with that group. I'm an actor. I, when I play the role and the role calls for profanity, then I cuss because that's the way I earn my living. Well, Paul messed up the way she earned her living. Because the way she earned her living was she, she was a soothsayer. And she could, she could tell, read people's fortune. I wonder if she read her own that day when she met Paul. Paul turned around and cast the devil out of her. And when he cast the devil out of her, she couldn't soothsay anymore. And she, her masters lost money and they fired her. And Paul and Silas got in trouble with the authorities. And they ended up having to leave, praise the Lord, Philippi. But they left Philippi convinced that Jesus is the way. Yeah. They left Philippi convinced that you got to preach Jesus everywhere you go. So they leave walking. They didn't have nice chariots like we have now. They left walking and they walked through that long path. And one day, hallelujah, while everybody was doing their thing, four troublemakers walked into town. Can I get a witness? When they walked into town at first, they received no pushback. Paul, being a logical soul winner, went first and found a synagogue. And, uh, and then began to, see, he needed to talk to folk first who had some knowledge of the scripture. And he began to open and allege, praise the Lord, as he talked to them, that Christ must needs have suffered. Now, the problem that the Jews had was that they weren't they wasn't looking for no suffering Savior. They weren't looking for a suffering Messiah. They were looking for someone to come and free Israel from Roman rule. But they didn't understand, and Paul had to show them in Isaiah 53, Psalms 22, Psalms 69, that the, that the Messiah had to suffer first. And so he would argue in the scriptures showing them that actually it wasn't time yet for a reigning Messiah, but there had to be a suffering Messiah, and that the Messiah had to die, but that God would raise the Messiah from the dead, and that God indeed did raise the Messiah from the dead. And, uh, and that he, so he, he, the point was, there had to be a cross before there was a crown. And I want you to get that, saints. Ain't nobody gonna wake up overnight and you're the bishop. You're not going to wake up overnight and you're the first or the second or the third. You're not going to wake up overnight and you're getting a big offering. No, hallelujah. You're going to bear your cross. Amen. You're going to get your feelings hurt. You're going to get disappointed. Amen. Members going to join and leave. That ain't, that ain't no new thing. If anybody's going through it right now, just know every one of us know what you're talking about. Everybody knows the feeling. And don't you ever assume that you're so wonderful that you can get there without going through, praise the Lord, your cross. Everybody has to do their time. Everybody has to pay their dues. But if you can hang on in there, if you just stay saved and wait on the Lord, when the time is right, God will bring you out. Somebody's going through today. I'm gonna tell you something. Despise not the days of small things. Hallelujah, shout while you're small. 
Wave your hands while you're small. Money funny and you, you change is strange. Give God praises so your memories will be of the small days that you are a praiser. Then you can really praise him when the blessing come because you praise him whether you are blessed or not. A prerequisite to, for praise ought not to be when God give you what you want. You ought to praise him because he's God. Lying is good. Somebody shout something right now. Throw your hands up and declare he's praiseworthy. So he, he went to the synagogue and began for three weeks, three weeks, three Sabbath days, three weeks opening and alleging that Jesus is Christ. And, 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 and see, from the, from the Sabbath day, Sunday through uh, Friday, the leaders of the synagogue would discuss what Paul preached on the Sabbath. So they would debate all week. And, uh, and for three weeks, my God, they let him fly. And he walked in there, and he was a worthy preacher. First of all, this is why he got to join NC Academy. Uh, NC Third Academy, Paul was a well-schooled rabbi. We want to train you. We want to train you, teach you how to preach. We want to teach you how to be, to connect your sermon. We want to teach you how to be coherent in your thought. We want to teach you how, praise the Lord, to be an apologist. An apologist is a defender of the faith. We want to train you where you can sit on your hands with no emotion, no hooker nor messiah and explain how you know that you've been born again. We want to explain, we want to train you to cry loud and spam out, but to be able to tell it when you're whispering. But praise the Lord, we want to train you in how to go into the hospital and pray for the sick. You don't go in there screaming, hollering, folk can hear you all the way down to the other end of the aisle. Don't you know that God hears a whisper just like God hears a shout? Ah, we want to train you. Paul was a well-trained rabbi, and then he had with him Silas, who was a Jew. He was from Jerusalem, so they liked him. And then there was Timothy. Timothy was a half-Jew, but he had already been circumcised by Paul. And who was making up the rear was the storyteller, the note-taker, the, the writer, Dr. Luke the Gentile. But Luke had no say, and these men came in there. And every Sabbath day for three weeks, Paul would preach to them this revolutionary, you talk about revelation, this revolutionary new doctrine, a doctrine that wasn't uh, dependent upon uh, the uh, Passover, a doctrine that wasn't dependent upon what Moses did when he brought them out of Egypt, but a brand new thing that on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame. And I want you to know, that after a while, the time came for Paul to make the altar call. He said, well, I preached to you for three weeks. I want to know, is there anybody here who want to know Jesus? And Jews got saved. And they told, the, they told the priest of the synagogue, we're with him. And they consorted with Paul and Silas. And my God, the Hellenized Jews, a whole big multitude of them, they ran and gave their hearts to the Lord. And then the upper class women with their fine selves humbled themselves and they got saved. Now notice that the people of the synagogue they were moved to envy. Why envy? Well, they noticed that when the pre high priest in the synagogue preached, nobody responded to him like that. They noticed that Judaism didn't have the Jews. They noticed that there was no fire in what they were preaching. The false teachers noticed that people didn't get excited like they were getting excited when Paul preached. Preachers go home and preach till they get excited. Preach until you shake them up for Jesus. And they were jealous because revival had come to town. Good God Almighty. And you know how it is 
when you serve the Lord and when you preach the gospel if you don't know it you better you got to get prepared for pushback because if you think you're going to get to where God wants you to get to without resistance you're wrong the devil will try to afflict your body the devil will try to afflict your money the devil will attack your, your congregation the devil will attack your ministry the devil will stir up the city against you you know I know praise the Lord the devil will have preachers who used to fellowship with you not fellowshipping anymore then they want to get with you when they see God bring you out and you're doing better than they are but they didn't stand for the Lord and they noticed that with Paul people were getting saved and the excitement was back and the joy was back so they got jealous and went and found wicked folk went and found lazy people went and found unemployed folk and stirred them up in a rental mob they were Antifa before there was an Antifa and there they go protesting Paul and Silas no justice no peace protesting trying to put the man of God out of business somebody ought to pray for me tonight and uh, Paul and Silas these four men they went to Jason's house and Jason put them up and the mob found out that they were at Jason's house and the mob went to Jason's house and they didn't even have respect they are just like these mobs today they are blocked the road they are come into your home they are, they, you can't go to the store for them good God almighty they seize government buildings they're just a, a, a wicked mob they went to Jason's house and they went in there looking for Paul Silas Timothy and Luke but God had hid them so they grabbed Jason pulled him out thank God for a Jason Thank God for a Jason, a man that would put his life on the line to protect the man of God, a man that would put everything he had on the line to protect the truth of God. Let me tell you something. You can't be a sellout and have God's anointing. You can't be a sellout and have God's power. You can't be a sellout. You can't get, you can't get quiet when it's time to speak up and expect God to move for you, but you got to be willing to put it all on the line to go for broke if they leave let them go if they talk let them talk but if the Lord be for you oh, if the Lord be for you somebody leap up and down if you believe the Lord is for you You know who else said this? The prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah told the Lord, with the Chaldeans being so close that you could hear the horses breathing, that you could hear the hoofs, as they were getting ready to capture Jerusalem. Uh, Jeremiah said, God remember that I preached for you. God remember me. Remember that I didn't compromise. Remember me, Lord, that I didn't take down. Somebody here tonight can tell the God of the Bible, Oh, Lord, remember me. I stood for you, Lord. I cried loud. I lost my job. But I kept on standing for Jesus. And how many know that God has a good memory? How many know that he will remember you? Yeah. Yeah, Lord. I want you to praise him if you've stood for him. I want you to glorify him because he will. Throw your hands up and use your preaching voice and say, Lord. Oh, my. What a mighty God. They 
pulled him. They pulled Jason out. They called the authorities and they said, we were fine the way we were. We were happy the way we were. We were doing good the way we were. But three days, three weeks ago, troublemakers came to our city and troublemakers began to preach about this Jesus. When I read it, I just stopped and began to pray and said, Lord, make me a troublemaker. Lord, give me strength to upset things, to shake up the city, to make them all mad. Can I get a witness in here? Do I have any troublemakers? Do I have any troublemakers? Well, give God a troublemaker's praise. Our troublemakers anointed, our troublemakers praise, our troublemakers stance. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Won't he save you? Won't he pick you up? Won't he turn you around? Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, anoint me to be a troublemaker because there is only one king and his name is Jesus. Why don't you call his name right now? Jesus, the sweetest name I know, Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's joy. There's love. There's hope. Yeah. Yeah. Praise it right now. Oh, 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 Lord. I think I preached enough. I think you get the point. I think you're ready for your anointing. I think you're ready to go back home and disturb the prostitute, disturb the arrogant, Disturb the LBGT, disturb Planned Parenthood, disturb, disturb that false preacher, disturb that dead church, disturb that backslidden person, disturb everybody who lost their fire, set their souls on fire again. Let them know that there is a reality in serving the Lord. Let them know that he is a keeper. Let them know that can't nobody do you like Jesus. No! Do I have anybody who still believes that? Nobody. Somebody shout, nobody, nobody. We were doing good. It was fine the way it was to them troublemakers. 
came to town. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. Four men turned the city upside down. Really, they were turning things right side up. But upside down was the expression that meant they have disturbed everything. Look at us now. At one time, we were all with one accord. Happy and lost. We were all with one accord. Happy and spiritually dead. The Muslims didn't bother the, the, uh, uh, the Judas. The, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the synagogue didn't bother the mosque. And the temple of the false gods didn't bother these other folk. And they all got together. And they all sang, Kumbaya. And when they prayed, they never prayed in the name of Jesus. They were praying in your name. The name of a pronoun. And they wouldn't, when they would speak of God, so that, they, so that they wouldn't offend anybody, they wouldn't say which God. But then, some Jesus only. Woo! Some Jesus people came to town and shook up everything because they had power. Power. I want to pray for you that God released tonight the anointing to disturb the comfortable and to comfort the feeble-minded. But there are a lot of Things that are set up in society now that we have acquiesced to yep, right. yep, yep. and we won't speak up about. God didn't call us for acquiescence. Right. God called us to stand out. Right. The nature of holiness is that we've always stood out. The sanctified church was always the exception. Praise the Lord. When the others learn to be sadiddy and how to fold their arms and to get fancy, the sanctified church was still speaking in tongues. Yeah, 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 yeah. When the others learn to preach and smoke cigarettes, going to the preacher's office, ashtrays everywhere. Back there puffing and smoking and preaching. Uh -huh. The sanctified preacher said, not so. Not so. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. But we learn for to get rumps in the seats. We learn to compromise. We went to one church growth seminar too many. I've always felt that they were of the devil. Because once your number one goal and objective becomes numbers, you're compromised. Because you, it, it's no longer God's truth. And God's truth costs you people. Amen. Because not everybody loves God's truth. Not everybody loves God's truth. Amen. And you got to know how to stand on God's truth when your, your buddy down the street isn't standing on God's truth. And now all of a sudden he's drawing more people than you. And he's drawn some of yours. And then the devil go to talking. That's the pushback. You've been preaching holiness, all right? Well, look at this. Mother so-and-so is gone. And that brother who used to be with you, you were watching this man's broadcast the other day, and you saw that Negro in his church. Sitting there laughing and smiling. Hurt your feelings and broke your heart. Then the devil said, well, if you wasn't, if you wasn't talking about all that stuff, wouldn't been talking about. If you wasn't talking, if you just learned to be quiet, if you just dropped that mess, you, you would hate they, they would still be with you. Come on. Now, at that point, you have to decide whether you want to be God's troublemaker or the devil's lap boy. Praise the Lord. Boy, where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? See, because see, see, because if you're going to be in this, in this, we're called to be troublemakers. 
for Jesus Christ. To preach what others would dare to preach. To say it. To say it. When you know the house is full and everybody noticed. I was somewhere the other night and I preached and all these the folk, wickedness everywhere. Everybody act like they didn't see it. I preached about that. I said, now everybody act like you all don't see this. You know, I, you were with me? I, 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 really, really, I tell you what I did. I took some horses with me. And you know what, uh, Apostle? Uh, John, the battle was over when I walked in because I had some powerful men with me and, and it intimidated the whole house. And so I said, uh, um, you act like you don't see because I'm trying to win souls. And, and, and the powers that be, all of the, 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 the somebodies in there, they looked at me hard. So when I finish, when I finish, I said, you know, tonight I could make an altar call and have everybody to stand where they are. Since, you know, I preached them to this, they were like you, standing. I said, I could just pray for everybody now and that would be it. But I'm not going to do that. That's what you said. That's what you said. Instead, I'm going to open this altar and everybody who wants this, yes, sir. leave your seats yes, sir. and come to the altar. Amen. Yes, Praise the Lord. Yes, now, I don't know how they're going to respond, right, right. but God didn't call me to make me look good. Right. God called me to preach the gospel. And if nobody comes, I still was called to preach the gospel. I threw it out there. 80% of the church came to the altar. Amen. And the powers that be who didn't think that that kind of preaching would move those people learned something. Amen. Because the, the gospel took them to school. Yes. Let me tell you something. You stand for the Lord yes, Lord. and you trust God for the results. Oh, You trust God for the results. Some of us are worrying ourselves to death because we're too results oriented. Come on. We're not preachers aren't called to be results oriented. Right. Right. Preachers are called to be preachers. Preacher. We leave the results to God. Right. Amen. Amen. But I've been preaching, but I don't see any results. Well, stop looking. And just preach. Do what the Lord tells you. And God will do the rest. Amen. I want to be anointed, Lord. I want to be anointed to walk into Satan's kingdom and cast out devils. I want to be anointed to go into the hospitals and lay hands on sick people and they get well. I want to be anointed to cause a problem, to preach to where I upset the wicked. I don't want to upset the righteous. And you know what? The righteous love good preaching. But God, I want to have the effect that Paul had on my Thessalonica that he had on his. If you want to be anointed to be God's troublemaker, meet me at the altar. And I'm going to pray. And we're done. We're done. Glory to God. And when you get back to where you serve, they're going to be talking about you. Though they, they've caused problems other places, now they're here causing problems. Causing problems. Causing problems. We were fine. Everybody got along good. Amen. We, we had good ecumenical fellowship. Praise the Lord. Yes, and then one knucklehead had to insist there ain't nobody God but Jesus. We were getting along good. Me and the Iman, we were all right. We were just brothers. I had to mess the thing up. They said, well, Allah can't save. Man, I thought we were friends. We are, but Allah can't save. But we're going to have prayer. I got to lead the prayer. Well, why you got to lead the prayer? Because I'm the only one who's Oh, my God is the only true God because brother Muslim your God is not God stir it up 
Paul said, I'm not going to leave you in Judaism. I'm not going to leave you in the synagogue. I didn't come to leave you comfortable in what God was doing yesterday. I come to tell you that you are waiting for somebody who has come, died, and has been raised from the dead and has ascended back to heaven and he will return someday. And this stuff you're doing, God's no longer in that. He was, but you all missed it. And Brother Keverick, super job. You blessed us. He shook up the synagogue. He shook up the city. I want to shake it up. If God make me a bishop and let me shake it up, I go along with that as long as he let me shake it up. If God dressed me up and let me shake it up, I'll go along with that as long as he let me shake it up. If he let me drive a nice car and shake up the city, I'll go along with that as long as he let me shake it up. He can take those other things. He can take the bishopric, he can take the car, he can take the house, he can take all that, but Lord, let me shake it up. See, that, see that's, that's the priority. That's the thing. That's where we say. Father, you have brought us to this place. We fasted, Lord. We prayed. We asked you to be pleased with our convocation. We asked you that if we did anything through strife or vainglory for you to forgive us, show us our error, and we'll change. We said to you in prayer, that when this meeting is over, we want you to be pleased with what we've done. Hallelujah. And Father, we, we pleaded with you for your presence. Now, Lord, you kept your word and you showed up. Lord, you blessed us. Father, now we come to the close of this meeting saying, oh God, we got a question. You blessed us, but Lord, did we bless you? God, did we please you? Lord, if we miss, forgive us, because we tried. And now, Lord, we ask you tonight to send on the anointing, the same anointing that those four men had, an anointing that would cause them to walk into the devil's den and declare that the strong man is bound, an anointing that would give them power to declare, I see Satan falling as lightning from the sky anointing that gives us power to declare that there's only one king and that's King Jesus in the name of Jesus father tonight anoint us as we go back home to shake up our cities to shake up our churches to shake up our towns to be God's troublemakers in the name of Jesus so that souls can be saved lives can be changed people can be convicted that people can be made ashamed shame Lord give us a word that will shame the sinner out of their sin a word that will fire up the believer a lifestyle that will cause people to want to follow us Jesus Jesus, anoint us tonight. Make us troublemakers for the King of kings and for the Lord of lords. If you believe right now, begin to receive your anointing. Begin to tell God, thank you. I know it's tight on the altar. I know there's not much room to move, but saints of God, right where you are, just slip up your hands lift up your voice cry loud tell him make me your troublemaker yeah Woo! the anointing is moving the anointing is moving the anointing is moving the anointing is moving an anointing to cause a disturbance, an anointing to make a difference, an anointing to cause people 
to want to come to church, to cause people to want to serve the Lord, to cause people to consort with us, to join us, to become a part of us. Come on, NC third. Just a minute more, just a minute more. I'm like Mother Perry, keep it coming, keep it coming, keep the praise coming, keep the praise coming, cry out to the Lord, yeah! Every elder, every pastor, every superintendent, supervisor, every missionary, every mother, every minister, every layman, every man, woman, boy, and girl, cry out! the troublemakers anointing. Yeah! Yes, Lord! Say one word to your name. Thank you. But will you now look at your neighbor and say, Congratulations, troublemaker? Because I got it. Yeah! 